Welcome to the Resilient Sessions podcast. My name is Alice Driver, and I'm delighted to welcome Michael Kane's MBE and Mark Ulmrod. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. The Resilient yeah. Sessions podcast was born out of a conversation between myself and Sai Hoama, who is a military veteran and was injured out in Afghanistan in 2009. He said that when he was in hospital recovering, the days were really busy with people coming and going, but it was the nights that he found really hard as they were so quiet. He wanted to be able to pop in his headphones and just listen to something that would give him a slither of hope and be part of a positive conversation. So the podcast's aim is to create meaningful, insightful, hopefully inspiring conversations between two unlikely individuals who come together to talk about their experiences, careers, challenges, and how they've handled resilience in their own lives to act as, we hope, inspiration to those listening. Now, to you both, we always start the podcast with each guest interest introducing each other. So, Michael, would you like to go first and introduce Mark to us, please? Yes, of course. Mark Ormrod, his... Uh... In the early hours of Christmas Eve 2007, Royal Marine Commander Mark Conrad was on routine foot patrol in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, when he stepped on and triggered an improvised explosive device. Thanks to the swift action of the men around him and the intervention of the medical emergency response team, he was airlifted to an emergency field hospital in a desperate attempt to try and save his life. He woke up three days later in the UK in Celio Hospital, <laughs> Birmingham, both legs amputated above the knee and his right arm amputated above the elbow. He was the UK's first triple amputee to survive the Afghanistan conflict. During his recovery, the doctors told him that he would never walk again and that he should prepare himself for the rest of his life in a wheelchair. However, Mark used his setback as a springboard for growth and reinvention. Today, Mark is an internationally acclaimed motivational speaker a peak performance coach, and the author of the award-winning autobiography, Man Down. He is a relentless charitable fundraiser and a daredevil who has performed stunts that many able-bodied athletes would find daunting. He has not used a wheelchair since 2009 and jokes about the fact that children call him the Iron Man because of his high-tech prosthetic legs. He is a mentor and a role model to other amputees and an ambassador to the, for the Royal Marines Association. Mark has three children, a beautiful wife, an insatiable lust for life. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Now, Mark, over to you. Would you introduce Michael to of us all? Of course. Michael Keynes was born in Exeter in 1969 and adopted into a large and loving family. He gained his passion for food from his mother, who he used to enjoy helping in the kitchen. Michael attended Exeter Catering College, then spent time honing his skills in Oxfordshire and France. He returned to Devon to take up the position of head chef at Gidley Park, already one of the most prestigious restaurants in the country. Yet only two months into the job, he suffered a terrible car accident in which he lost his right arm. Remarkably, he was back in the kitchen part-time within two weeks and full-time after just four more determined than ever to pursue his dream of reaching the top of his profession. Michael held two Michelin stars for 18 consecutive years at Gidley Park, and in 2016 he took the leap of faith to create his own country house hotel, Limpston Manor. Here, just six months from opening, Michael and his team were awarded their first Michelin star. Michael appears regularly on Saturday Kitchen, and has made numerous appearances on MasterChef, The Great British Menu, and Sunday Brunch. He's cooked in 10 Downing Street for the Prime Minister, was awarded the AA Chef's Chef of the Year in 2007, and received an MBE in 2006. In 2015, he was made free man of the City of Exeter. Michael has a long history of commitment to community and to charities. He supports and encourages the next generation of hospitality stars through the Michael Keynes Academy at Exeter College and is the founder of the Exeter Festival of Southwest Food and Drink. Through the Michael Keynes Foundation, he supports Families for Children, Farms for City Children, Exeter Chiefs Exeter Foundation and One for the Boys. 
Thank wow. you very much. <laughs> I know, I feel like I'm in good company today <laughs> with you both. Okay. Now, I, I, you know, thank you both for being here and being part of the conversation. But actually, I think, Michael, we need to thank you uh, uh, because um, we're currently here at your the beautiful Limston Manor in East Devon. Uh, and I sort of wrote up what I thought it would be like. Um, then I get here and it's absolutely stunning. Thank you. Um, so this has been a bit of a labour of love for you, hasn't it? Yeah, it's um, it's a realisation of dream, really, and and, uh, and it's just great to be able to you know f- you know, have that sort of fulfilment of, of a lifetime ambition, and um, and just reading then just made me I feel very humbled to be in Mark's company, but also lucky that I've been able to pick myself up and and get myself to to where I am, and. Um, and I think you know, you know, when you, in life's tough. When you go outside and looking at a view, you just realise actually, you know, we, we should make the most of it. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And we're in one of the bedrooms at the moment. Yes. Yeah. And I can just say to anyone, I think Mark, you'll agree that you should definitely come and check this place this, out. This place is unreal. You know, it's, it's not often I'm just kind of like in awe, and I just drove in and my jaw hit the floor, <laughs> and then I came in this place in this room, and it's just it's stunning, absolutely stunning. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So now let's find out a bit about you both. Um, Mark, you're actually our first Marine to be on um, the series. Okay. Everyone else has been Army. Um, and now without wanting to cause a sort of diplomatic <laughs> incident here, but because um, you, you trained up the road at the Commander Training Centre. I did, yeah. But what does it mean to be a Marine? Do you know what? It, it's, while I was serving... That's who I was, you know, when everyone's like, oh, do you know Mark Ormrod? That Yeah, he's a Royal Marine. And that, that's, it's an incredible feeling. It's, it's your identity. But when you leave, you kind of, I personally felt like I lost it a little bit, but now I feel like I've got it back as, as a veteran. I think in the, in the UK as a whole, veterans are kind of getting a big, much bigger profile. Whereas, you know, before you used to leave the military and it was, he's ex-military. When you go to somewhere like America and it would be staff sergeant so-and-so, retired I feel we're kind of following that a little bit more now so you know being in the Marines I've been in since I was 17 you know and it meant everything to me and I kind of still feel like I am very tightly in that family now because of the way things have changed over the last eight or ten years and you still sort of live and breathe those values that you learned back there yeah I, I, I completely crossed them over from my military life into my personal life and it's, it's just part of who I am and I, I enjoy living that way you know and so, you're a local boy aren't you 40 minutes down the road in, in Plymouth yeah with two F's um, so it wasn't far for me to come today okay so I need to pronounce it like that with two F's okay yeah. cool and Michael you're local a local yeah, boy as I'm well I'm an right? exeter boy oh okay <laughs> alright so technically we're rivals if, if, I, if I liked football we'd be rivals okay. yeah we would so. okay well let's hopefully we'll be friends today <laughs> of course but um, you chose a very different path to the military and you became a chef um what do you still want to achieve with your cooking? Well, actually, I was always going to go into the military oh. with the Marines being so close. It was either that or the Paras. And I had uh, entry for Marines. So that was actually originally going to be my, my, my journey. I was in the cadets and everything. But I also, alongside that, you know, I had this wonderful childhood where I, you know, was the youngest of six children. Obviously, I was adopted. Um, which, but, but, you know we all had chores to do so washing up hoovering and I enjoyed cooking and we used to grow vegetables and uh, fruit in the garden bring them in and turn them into delicious meals but never really thought of it as a career because okay. my mind was set on joining the forces and uh, and to very later on in, in my sort of uh, time at school when I decided that I wanted to be a chef and that was it and I never looked back um, and at first it was oh chef and military maybe do it together and then I was persuaded that two years at college would be good fun and it was okay. um and that's the course I took in the end so yeah wow so, so a different a very different path yeah a different what? path you know my father was a, a RAF pilot he, he flew hunter hawkers and lightning so that was the only sort of military background we had I think my parents are just relieved I didn't go into the the forces um but um there was no one in our family that had ever you know been in in hospitality as a as okay a, from the moment I started cooking professionally, I've never looked back really. I've loved it. It's been yeah. incredible. And you've done you've done a right for yourself. Doing this I think you made the right choice. Yeah. yeah looking around. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good. Now, Mark, um 
I want to want you to take us to Afghanistan. Okay. Um, we're in sort of 2007, and you're mm-hmm. now a fully fledged member of the Marines, and you're out with your company in Afghanistan. Can you tell us what you were doing out there? Um, I mean, we're just doing what all the other guys leading up to that point had done. You know, we we would go out and. So there were two main bases, uh, Camp Bastion and Kandahar, and those were the air bases, the safe zones. Some people would spend their entire tour there, and then other people, like like me and my unit, we'd go there for a couple of days to acclimatize, get on the back of a helicopter, and then get flown out to a remote location into what we call a FOB, forward operating base, down in Helmand, and we'd operate from there. And you know, each FOB had its own area of responsibility, had its own mission, you know, and, and objectives during that tour. And on our tour, uh, a lot a lot of people think, you know, the Marines is all about, you know, taking out bad guys and blowing stuff up and stuff. But our overall mission was to win the hearts and minds of the locals and provide security for those guys, look after those guys, give them a better quality of life. So that was our mission when we got there. You know, we had a certain area that we had to patrol and look after. We would look after the guys, the civilians, other guys from other units at that time were building schools for children and that kind of stuff. And then we just, we'd fight off the enemy and, and keep them away. And while in unison with other parts of the unit and other organizations that were all at the same pace trying to achieve the bigger objective. Okay. So, you know, it was a lot of foot patrolling, a lot of getting out on the ground, being proactive, um, conducting missions, confiscating weapons caches, disrupting enemy positions, that kind of stuff. And then obviously reactively defending our positions from incoming enemy attacks. So So can you tell us what happened on Christmas Eve of that year when you were out in Africa? Yeah. So Christmas Eve, we were tasked with going on another foot patrol. Nothing different to what we'd done before. In fact, when you look back at it, it was... It was the easiest one we probably done in the three and a half months that we were there. It was very basic. We weren't venturing out very far. And um, the idea was to leave the the camp that we were working out of, the FOB, from the rear gate, patrol around in two sections, around the opposite sides, meet at the front gate and come back in. So it, it was really easy. So we did that. You know, we left. I was in the section that went north. Uh, the other guys went south. And then the quick version is, as, as we were... Or Judah, we, we just we were stopped temporarily, gathering ourselves together to go back into the front entrance to camp, and then finish up for the day. And just before we did finish, um, I wandered into a minefield with my section and stood on and detonated an improvised explosive device. Wow. Yeah, not a smart thing to do. Uh, I've had better Christmases, but it is what it is. And so, what was the immediate impact of stepping on that IED? Physically, mm-hmm. both legs um, pretty much ripped off from the knees down and my right arm, it was still attached. But if you imagine everything, all your bicep, forearm was just ripped open and shredded and the whole bone had been shattered inside. So it wasn't salvageable. Um, and then it's only really, you know, thanks to the professionalism of, of the guys on the ground and everyone after that, that, that I'm here today and the more the more time goes on the more people I meet from that incident the more I learn about my own story because at one point um, your medical team actually said that you were clinically dead just before you got into sh- the Chinook is that right? yeah I had no um, no pulse there were no veins to put intravenous lines in because they'd collapsed because of the blood loss and then when they put an oxygen mask on me, it, it should have steamed up if I was breathing, but it didn't. So, and it sounds really harsh, but they just shoved me in a corner and just like, that guy's dead. Because there was another guy injured who had shrapnel in his back. And in that situation, and that's how you prioritize casualties. If he's dead, he's dead. You just throw him in the side and you get to work on the other guy. So you don't have two dead guys. And it was only when one of the medics walked past me to get some equipment to go back and work on the other guy that they said my eyes started fluttering which meant that my heart was beating. So then he alerted some of the other medics and then two of them came over to me and performed a procedure on me, which was supposed to involve them drilling into my tibia and fibia and gave an intravenous lines through there, but I didn't have any because they'd been 
ripped clean off. So they made a, a very quick decision and they drilled into the front and back of my hip bone. They put the intravenous lines in through there and three or four minutes later, they said I was awake again. Wow. And, and I've listened to the uh, medic who performed that operation mm -hmm. and he said that he had never been done before. It was no. just literally like, where am I going to put this? Right. Well, I'll just sort of put it there. And so, thank yeah. God he did. So you, you've got to imagine... In all the training they did leading up to it, so it was only three days prior to that that the, whoever's in charge of the the army medical guys said yes we can use it, but they'd only ever practiced it in a sterile environment. Okay. Now you're in the back of a Chinook helicopter. You got one guy dead, one guy dying. There's sand dust everywhere. This thing's going left to right as they're taking off. They're avoiding incoming fire, and everyone's just all over the place. So to be able to make a decision like that, you know, that quickly and go right, we're gonna have to try the hip. Mm -hmm. having never been told to or trained to before is insane. And that's just testament to how good our medics are in, in, in the armed forces over here in the UK. Yeah, it's amazing. And you were the first triple amputee to s survive mm -hmm. Afghanistan, weren't you? Yeah. I mean, there were, there were other triple amputees before me, but unfortunately they, they didn't survive. These techniques weren't around then. Um, so yeah, I'm very fortunate in that from everyone, from the guys on the ground to those medics, to the surgeons, to the people back in the UK and everyone after that, you know, I'm, I'm extremely lucky to be here. Wow. Well, thank you for mm. sharing that. No and problem. I'll come back to you in a second. And um, mm -hmm. Michael, I want to bring you in here if that's okay. Um, now, you trained to be a chef, as, as we've heard, mm -hmm. and you'd proven yourself as this real talent. And you ended up as, um, I sort of ended up, you obviously worked very hard to become head chef of Gidley Park. And yes. that was back in 94. Um, can you tell us a bit about that time and that kind of journey of how you got there? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my training was, was you know, going off from college, Exeter, to, to London, year and a half there, Grosvenor House Hotel, and one Michelin star restaurant in London, followed by three years at the Cat Saison with Raymond Blanc. So I started as a commie and left as acting uh, junior Sue. Raymond suggested that I go to uh, France, so I decided to go work in two, three Michelin star, you know, establishments. One was in uh, Burgundy, the Hotel Coke d'Or, which is now called Aurelie de Bernard Oiseau. And, uh, and the other was in Paris with the uh, Joël Robichon. And uh, Robichon was described almost like, you know, SAS of kitchens, it's pretty wow. hard school. Um, but when I joined Oiseau, I was also the first English and black guy to work in the kitchen. So that was an interesting experience with only pigeon French. So, but I did two and a half years in France. And it was a brilliant experience working just over a year in uh, Burgundy and then a, a year in Paris. And it was whilst working in Paris, I got a call from Raymond who had recommended me for the head chef job at Gidley Park. So, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, I was 25 at the, at the time and thought, well, I'll, I'll go and have a, have, have a look. Um, my CV or, you know, it was pretty impressive and that pretty much got me the opportunity. So I came over in March, uh, cooked a couple of meals, got the job. And then started in June of that same year um, and came over uh, to, to England. And it was pretty hard work initially. It was a lot of hours without any time off. Um, but it didn't really matter. We were used to the hours. And so what sort of hours are we talking well, about? Well, you know, you kind of work, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning to, you know, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock at night and wow. maybe 7 o'clock in the morning. And that's the day. And then that was seven days when I started. So it was... It was pretty long, long hours and you don't mind doing it because I lived in, so it, it wasn't really an issue. And I kind of forgot that I had to do a, a go to a christening and, and I, you know, travel quite a distance um, to get to Wales. Uh, and, and that, you know, that was the mistake really is just, you know, driving. And I wanted to drive because I had this new car and I thought it was, you know, it was cool, I'll drive, you know. And I, I drove up okay and I, my brother and, and his girlfriend were in the car and I uh, went to the christening and the next day, you know, that, that, that afternoon I, I wanted to get back for work. So I said, oh, well, I'm going to drive back. And this is August, isn't it? Yeah, holiday. so it's August bank holiday. Pretty, I remember it being really hot and, you know, and, and starting to drive, it was OK. But then I just felt extremely tired. And, you know, you, you, you know, you think, well, open the window, turn the music up and you do all the things that you think are going to actually make a difference and they don't make you know, any difference. You've got to pull over. And so I thought, well, I better get off the motorway and... Uh, and I, I, I was so tired that I actually nodded off and missed the turning. So I thought, OK, well, I'll, I'll get to the next one. Now, it was bank holiday traffic, so you weren't, you weren't really going quick. 
And uh, I nodded off to sleep and the other two people in the car were already asleep. And so the car drifted from the outside lane into the inner lane, hit a barrier, which put me on a head-on collision to the centre barrier. I woke up on impact and the car rode and, you know, and as it rode, it took my arm off. Um, and we, you know, almost like roller coasted down the central reservation. And I, my brother said, what woke him up was me screaming no, because I n- instantly knew what had gone on. And you can hear the, the sound of the crunch of the metal and the, the carnage that's going on around you. And then the car jumped off the central reserva- uh, reservation and sort of luckily landed on the right side of the road, span a few times, and I was suspended upside down um in the car and and i kind of you know sort of then looked over and saw my arm was was uh, obviously gone and you know well actually before i noticed my arm i noticed my hand on the floor because my you, you know you you are strapped in and you're holding the steering wheel and that's the bit that you're gripping and in between mm. my wrist and my 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 uh, below elbow was taken out so the, immediately there was no there was no no chance of any repar- you know i knew it got the arm had gone my reaction to it was to get out of the car i couldn't you know and and i just got out of the car and started running away and then all all of these people just came towards me and a number of different sequences it's a bit like mark was saying about you learn about your accident mm-hmm. through the stories of others and you know, the, the, a, a lorry driver pulled, pulled in front of us to stop oncoming cars. You know, somebody stopped and got out. Just so happens that a, a medic, medic from the army who had spent a lot of time working in Northern Ireland, you know, got out and came towards me to deal with my, you know, they put me on the, the And were the, you just walking along? At this... I was running away, you know, I was, I was out of there. It was a bit of an odd... All I could say is your, your reaction is to get away from the scene because... Yeah that's the horror that you're trying to get away from but and they what put... t- time period is this Instant. you know from like are we talking sort of minutes no from the only the... way i could get out the car was on my side and it, if you see the car you'd be lucky that you survived it and got out anyone got out alive and the fact that no one else was injured yeah. was a miracle so you know my instant reaction was get out of the car which i managed to wiggle out of the car and then run away not run away but you know travel away from the mm. car and then I, everybody came towards me and laid me down. And then they started trying to work on saving me, which took a while, as you can appreciate, for things to happen. And, and uh, you know, and I, was, I was awake, so I, I know exactly what was going on around me. And I was very, I began to fade away, very tired. By the time um, everybody came, they were concentrating on keeping me alive. Um, and that was about not falling asleep and not okay. going, going, slipping into a coma. So... And were you in a pain? Because of... sometimes <laughs> yeah. people say initially, actually, you don't feel any pain. No, no, no it's very painful, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you were in a lot of pain, weren't you? Yeah, well, so what's happening is, you know, you, you, the, the pain is, is, is the adrenaline is obvious. Um, and the, the, the adrenaline is there. Okay, so, you know, you, you know that you've lost your arm and, and it, it's, it's painful. Mm-hmm. But what was funny, though, and it's when the, uh, there's a lady called Geraldine, she was, oh, I, yeah. I just wanted to, I just wanted to fade away. I just want. I say. I mean, I'd lost my arm. I was right-handed. I, 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 you know, what's the point in living? It was my mindset. I didn't know anyone had lost their limbs. The only person I knew is Lord Nelson. He was a hero. So, I was feeling pretty, da- pretty, pretty, pretty bad. And, um, but this lady was leaning over me, and I remember she had a, she kind of was, you know, keeping me on the floor, and she had a knee in my other arm, and I said to her, you know, my arm's hurting, and she went. Yeah, I know you've lost your arm. I said, no, not that arm, the arm that you're kneeing into. You know, it was really <laughs> annoying pain. Okay. So you had this capacity to isolate the pain and yet know that the other arm was hurt and he, for different reasons because she was kneeling on it. It's a trauma accident yeah. and, and, I was, and I was awake. So you're dealing with the psychological issue of coming to terms with what's happened to you and the physical issue of, you know, the fact that you're losing a lot of blood. And in the end, you know, they 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 stabilised my 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 situation and got me to hospital, and they just had to save my life by operating yeah. uh, rather than there was nothing to save. I knew there was nothing to save. I mean, uh, you know, you could see what was missing. I've got a very similar position in terms of the just below elbow, and 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 nothing really was salvageable. So, 
and I was uh, I was awake and I said you know I just want to know you know can you save my arm and they went no we can so at least when I woke up I knew mm. um what happened to me and I, I could I that was all that I think was the start of coming to terms with it was living through the accident and knowing that you know I kind of got to a point where I, I, I wanted to live and survive the accident because people made me see the bigger picture of my circumstances mm. family loved ones and and, and whatnot mm. and and um and that gave me a focus to survive the immediacy and then when you wake up you know you you're just dealing with the reality of your new circumstance it's, 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 i was just gonna say it's funny you say that because so i remember my entire incident as well and people mm. say you know how do you be so positive with it and and I'm, I'm a big believer in, like you, that because you remember it and you went through it, when you wake up, you are more able to deal with it. And a lot, I've got a lot of friends who were knocked unconscious from blasts who don't remember everything. And then they suffer with flashbacks and things later on. Mm. But so much of the stuff you're saying, obviously I can relate to it. Like yeah. how much goes through your head in a short space of time? Like you said, you're lying on the floor and straight away you're thinking, I don't know anybody who's an amputee and this, that and the other. It's bizarre, and it? It, it, yeah, and it feels very surreal, doesn't it? Like when you go through a traumatic incident, like all those people that are around you, it's like a dream. Yeah. And you're just, your head's going at 150,000 miles an hour, but outside is slow. Yeah, it you know, is. It's bizarre. And it, it's almost like it, it also, you, you, you almost detach yourself from the situation. And they say, you say, you know, your life flashes in front of you before you, you know, before you die. No, I didn't die. My dad says, well, it wasn't your time. Fair enough, dad. But, you know, it was tough. It was tough to survive it mm. as it was for you. But for me, um, you contemplate what your life has been. That's what I did. I thought if I die now, which is a possibility, mm. then I, n- I need to make sure that I think about everything, about what it is. And I was happy to, to at that, if that was the, co- if that was the consequence of my accident to, to leave it there, um, but since then, I've been living my life like it's my last day every day, because you also come away from something like that, and you realise that, you know, life is short and it's cruel, and it can be, you know, a, a small mistake by me, as it was, uh, you know, to fall asleep, and I paid the ultimate uh, price for that, and um, and I felt, you know, ultimately that, um, you know, that experience was. Um, you know, it was difficult to, to deal with um, after more so than the actual survival part. It was living with the disability that in, in a way became more challenging. Mm. You know, nightmares were the days and dreams were, you know, I dreamt that I had two arms, woke up, I had one. You know, you took me a year to come to terms with looking back at my life and thinking, well, this time last year, you know, think, and then a year later you progress and you look back and you think, well, look how much progress I've made, mm. look you know look how different things were a year ago and and that whole small steps you know leading to your recovery both mentally and physically is is really important how did you get through that well it's interesting because um other than the loss of arm i they couldn't believe that was no uh, any other um superficial or or any other injuries so i was after being released from hospital after six days I, i got i went home that was difficult leaving hospital because it's all secure. Everyone comes to see you, you know, you, you know, and then you you got to face the fact that you're driving home. Going home is always a, a difficult time anyway, and you're going back. This changed person, and I cried all the way home till I fell asleep. Got home, you know, welcome home, Michael. Everyone there to to, to see you. Went to the toilet, you know, cried again, and it was difficult. And then a couple of days later, my dad put up an art easel, and I thought, okay. well, what's the point? You know, I was right-handed. You know, now I'm left. And then I looked at it. I thought, well, I'll, I'll try. I'll start and I'll try and draw the, the the view and paint the view from the house. And it was a really good exercise because it made me realise that the eye to hand was still there, and I hadn't really lost anything. Well, I was lost my arm, but I hadn't. I could still think. I could still, you know, I still had my talent of my, you know, I just had to learn to use my left hand. So I went to the doctor to get my stitches out. Well, I said, what what can I what do I do now? And, he said, well, do what you want. I said, can I go back to work? And he said, yeah. So two weeks later, I went back part-time and uh, three, four weeks later, I went back full-time because I kind of just felt that I had to just get on with it. Yeah. Bizarrely, I didn't have an insurance payout. That's not a problem, but the point is, even if that was the case, I wasn't about to wait to see, you know, if I would cope. I just wanted to get back in, mm. get back on the bike and, and try and ride it and then rehabilitate back into the work environment. Um 
And so the first question was, you know, I lost my arm, is will I have my job? You know, yeah. you know, what will become of this career I'd worked so hard to, to achieve? But my work became my rehabilitation. You know, it, it was a very big part of moving my life on, was, you know, of getting back in the kitchen and getting, you know, to terms with that loss of arm and how I could rehabilitate, get a prosthetic and, and carry my life on, you know. And, and that was a big part of dealing with, it because a lot, so much of what I'd done in my life was about my career and about being a chef and the thought of not being a chef was more devastating so it's almost like well I've got nothing to lose yeah. ironically I'd have everything to lose so why not give it a go yeah I'll I'll try it I'll try it and um and so, so I, I did that's such an amazing attitude to have mm. and so practical mm. as well I mean I was sort of I knew that about you going back to work after two weeks I think I might have had longer time off you know with the yeah, flu could have done with holiday, so. <laughs> <laughs> um but it's it's that drive that clearly has helped you and i and that your career has been your rehab i mean yeah i think so it's the fear the fear of, of losing the opportunity it's the fear of every i might know this you know people prejudge people with disabilities all the time and whether or not that's you know the mental uh, agility or or, or 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 your physical ability people always assume that you, you, if you, you know, that's it, you're finished. So people have written me off mm. before I even got back to work. And so those prejudices are always there. And they can never imagine what it's like. And mm. how could they? Because we, we know what it's like to live yeah. with, you know, with one arm or, in your case, you know, triple amputee. It's, but I went to America to find out about prosthetics. And, and, and I met people who just had incredible courage and frankly were inspirational and made me look pretty lucky and I just thought what am I complaining about you know I've got my mobility yeah I've lost an arm but boy I have you know I've a better quality life than some people um even with two arms so mm. so it became a, a a less about feeling sorry for myself and, and more about a fulfillment of my own ambition and not letting this be an obstacle mm. and the other element was trying to use this as an inspirational story to help others yeah because like your program i didn't know anyone who'd lost no i mean this was pre-iraq and pre-afghanistan so we didn't have lots of servicemen and women or you know coming back from war zones with trauma um accidents and that and that therefore um made me think about people in a similar circumstance and that was difficult because i couldn't think of anyone other than horatio nelson and he was pretty pretty decorated and and I just was the guy that fell asleep at the wheel and I felt pretty pretty stupid frankly I think it's amazing what you've achieved and how that you just didn't want that to define you Mm. and you're sort of known for all these amazing achievements so I mean Mark you must be able to relate to what Michael's saying and I think um I know that you've spoken about you obviously you got injured in 2007 but in 2009 you stopped using a wheelchair mm-hmm. and you um have spoken about other above knee double amputees looking at you on your prosthetics and just going i can't believe this guy isn't in a wheelchair mm-hmm. and you went out to america as well i think to help you in that journey tell us a bit about that yeah so it was so back in hospital when um i was told i would never walk again because of how difficult prosthetics were um i went into a bad place and then i you know, we're blessed with the internet. So I got online, I did a bit of research, came across a guy called Cameron in America, who was a triple amputee. And I went out to meet him. First week I went to America, we went to a, a conference called the Amputee Coalition of America. And people flew in from all over the world. And I was new to this. And all these guys just kind of took me into this new family that I was quite resistant to be a part of and trained me and coached me and mentored me. And like you just said, I, I saw quadruple amputees. And I'm like, come on, life's easy. At least I've got one working on. <laughs> yeah. And these guys are walking around with double above knees, double above elbows, like the hardest form of amputation you could think of and just getting on with it every day. And they, they pushed me and they mentored me and they, they trained me and coached me to eventually, you know, I, I just ditched the wheelchair and was a full-time prosthetic user. And, and this year on the 9th of June, it's, it's 10 years. Wow. But a, a lot of people... The beginning, like any journey, is really, really, really difficult. Mm. But a lot of people shy away from it because a double above knee amputee takes between 300 and 500% more energy to do anything than anyone else. So often when I'm on stage, if I'm sharing my story for an hour, 
I tell the audience after, if you'd have been up here for an hour jogging on the spot, knees to chest for an hour trying to deliver a presentation, that's what it's like for me just to stand here. You know, it was unbelievably difficult, but I, like Michael, saw other people around me that were, in my opinion, in a worse situation who had it harder. And it, it just pushed me to, to feel grateful for prosthetics, for coaches, for mentors, for technology, the internet, being able to find guys online who are, have overcome their injuries mm -hmm. that could inspire me to go on to overcome mine. So I, I, my, my personal opinion is I don't think there's a better time in the history of the world to be disabled because everything's accessible now, yeah. you know? And um, Michael, you've spoken about the fact mm. the accident mm. has made you into being a better man. Can you tell us more about that? Well, you're at your lowest point, you know, and I only survived, and I'm sure Mark can relate to this, because other people stopped and took time to care for me at, at a time where I was hopeless. You know, I, I couldn't, you know, I never survived that day, but for the bravery of others to intervene and take time to ensure that I survived. Um, and so that makes you very humble because you realise actually that, you know, you don't take people for granted anymore. You don't, you know, you don't want to constantly oppress people. You want to help them get on in life as somebody did for me. So, you know, I look at life differently now and I look at life through uh, the eyes of somebody that is here because people took time yeah. uh, and courage to, 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 to help me survive. And, and that, that, that's a big part of my story, you know, and I, you know, I, I can't thank those people enough. Everybody paid their part, but equally at the same time, you know, um, you know, so much, you know, you can achieve in life with uh, a positive mindset and, and putting yourself around, you know, positive people. And, you know, and, and, and that's, that's really the way I, you know, I, I want to approach life. And that's why I'm a better person because I don't dwell on negatives because, you know, I believe you can do anything if you put your mind to it. And, and the brick walls, you know, you, you can't sometimes get through it, but if you, you can walk around it, you know, you, you don't, you can find another way or just come back to it later. So there's so many things I've learned, learned from what I've gone through. Um, wouldn't want a, anyone to go through what yeah. I've been through. It's not an easy thing. Not everyone has the strength either to, to persevere. That's why we have to, I'm sure Mark feels the same, we have to show our courage in, in, a, in a way that, that is humble, but at the same time inspirational for others because we know we had our dark moments and times and there are days when you didn't want to get up and go to work and there are days mm -hmm. that you, you know, didn't feel like you wanted to carry on. But we have, and life gets easier, n not less challenging, but we get used to living. And then we realise that actually, you know what, there's still a lot of lo life out there to, to live and lots of opportunities um, that, to be had, you know. And, that, and I think that's a blessing. Wow, thank you. That's a wonderful attitude to have. Now, Mark, you were passionate about the idea that everyone in life needs to take responsibility for their own actions. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of tell us more about that? Um, their actions, yeah, but also their situations. Okay. You know, so, uh, you know, every, every decision that any of us ever make through our entire lives leads us to exactly where we are right now. Mm -hmm. So I decided to join the military. I decided to be a soldier, to go to Afghanistan, to go out on that patrol. And so it, it's my responsibility not to blame the military, not to blame the Taliban, not to blame anyone else. It, it was me. So the way I found to be positive with my situation, I think, and, and to move forward with it is to accept responsibility for my situation as early on as possible and realise your decisions led to this point and now the, decision, the decisions you make from this point, you know, back when I was in hospital, are going to what take you, going to take you either to a good place or a bad place. Mm. So... You know, it's just about taking responsibility mm. for your situation, not blaming other people and realising that at the end of the day, you know, you can get a lot of help and assistance, but ultimately you're the only one that can take your life the way you want it to be. Michael, you were nodding your head there. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time asking myself, if not why, how, if only, you know, if only my arm was amputated lower down, it would have been easier. And But then you actually say, yeah, but, you know, you, you, you're here, you survived. Could have been worse, mm. but actually, you know, more importantly is what you do, you know, next that matters most, isn't it? And and I agree with that. You've got to take responsibility. You know, I fell asleep at the wheel. That was irresponsible. That's my fault. I'm blessed that we didn't, you know, nobody lost their life that day. And I'm also feel happier that I was the person that took the main 
the main effect of that accident, you know, and um, kind of live with that. Do you have you forgiven yourself for that? Yeah, oh my God, yeah. But, but I think we can you, all sort of relate, all relate to that. To it, yeah. Absolutely, but I, but it could I'm happen to, to tell anyone. The story. Other people yeah. don't, and it's dangerous. So that campaign that says you know pull over and have a have a coffee and, and mm. a break is so important. I don't drive anywhere anymore, any of any distance. I get driven because my work. It you know just half an hour is fine, an hour max if I'm working a lot. Thereafter, it's just it's just too much of a risk for yeah. me because I'm I'm you know I I I still work a lot of hours. Yeah. I mean you know I've forgiven myself for it, and I've come to terms with it. Sometimes the disability bit, you know, the loss of arm not feeling so confident with you know at the beach or in a pool mm. but that takes time that's mm. more psychological that's pride you know that's yeah don't, don't you things. enjoy getting like the disabled parking space i don't get it because <laughs> I, I, I call it vip parking <laughs> and the disabled toilet they're always cleaner than everyone else's yeah so I always I'm like, like welcome to the executive bathroom <laughs> <laughs> so i just reframe it into something yeah, more positive. Absolutely. So it's more yeah. spacious exactly yeah. it's a luxury <laughs> But you gotta, we gotta make it. I mean, you know, we laugh about our disabilities or our, 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 our loss of limbs, and it is. We own it. We own it. You know, we mm-hmm. and we make it ours, and we can, you know, we can, you know, say that I'm harmless, and you know, and uh, you know, people come up to me and they they shake, they want to shake my arm, arm, and I <laughs> put my left foot, and he said, "What has happened to your arm, mate?" And I said, oh, "I lost it in a car accident." And they say, "Sorry," and I said, "No, it's not your fault. You know, don't, don't worry about it." But it, but you know, you you you've got to you've got to you got to go on and, and you know but not a brave face on but just enjoy life you yeah. know you know you can i long give forgive myself and long yeah. stop feeling sorry for myself yeah but i think there's this word inspirational that's kind of banded about a lot and i would genuinely say to both of you i would i would describe you both with that that word how, how do you feel about that well i just i guess a bit like you we just we just do what we do just because, do yeah that's, what, that's what i'd I struggle. Do you with hate it. being? No, I I, told I appreciate it, but I struggle with it because it is, you know, this has happened to us both and many others. But all we do is live our life and get on with it and be dads and husbands and have careers and it's a little bit harder and you're a little bit slower. But you're just effectively living. Mm. And I'm not. I don't think I'm much different to what I was before. It just took me getting free limbs blown off for people to realise it. Do you know what I mean? I, I, just, I was as motivated and as driven as I was before and I'd set goals and I had ambitions and everything. And um, yeah, it's just, it's just living, isn't it? Living your life. It is, but I think that's a, a Royal Marine Commando spirit is, I mean, you know, to do to become Royal Marine to achieve what you have achieved as an individual is not many people do. So, but, and, but, you know, and I know that, you know, I've met a lot, a lot of Marines, a lot of servicemen, very humble. They always put duty first uh, but I, I agree I, I love the fact that um, you know we can get on in, with our lives and have the courage to do that and whilst doing it you know be an inspirational role model because yeah I, I know that that, that even people who haven't been for our circumstances they're just having a tough day mm. and they turn on the TV and they see your story or listen to my story and they think you know what actually you know maybe life isn't so bad yeah. and, and our, our our effects are easy for people to see but some people carry mental health issues and yes, sure. you can't see you meet the person they look absolutely normal yet mm-hmm. um they struggle um with other demons mm-hmm. which you know which are mm-hmm. there of course and what do you have what advice do you have for anyone who's going through their own challenges and their dark days yeah i, I think you know, I'm coming from a big, smelly, hairy, former Royal Marine. It's quite difficult to say, but I think talking to people when you're in your darkest days helps a lot. You know, I don't think anyone should ever be too proud to either talk to somebody about what's going on inside or to reach out for help. You know, there are probably thousands of people that have helped me from the day I was injured to get to where I am now. And it's because I'm I'm not scared to ask for it. You know, if, if I need it, it was hard in the beginning because I was too proud. But when I realised the power that it had to reach out and say, listen, I'm struggling, can you help me with this? Cameron, can you teach me this? And I saw the results. I thought, well, why don't I do this sooner? You know, and a lot of people, especially men, I think, are, are too insular and they, they're too afraid to go and ask about whatever they're going too through. Proud. Too yeah. proud, yeah. And there's this whole stigma around everything. And, you know, my advice for anyone going through challenge or adversity or, or dark times is, Talk to someone about it, reach out for help. And then you touched on it earlier, Michael, just 
I think having good people around you is unbelievably powerful. Now, you've both spoken about the impact of your family. And Mark, you have three children. I do. And you met Becky, your wife, I think, was it a year before you got injured? Yes. And then you asked her to marry you. I did. I, I woke up uh, after a three-day coma. And all I really remember was, it was like a scene out of a movie where you someone's on a going into an A&E and they're getting rushed in on a car and they just see the lights on the ceiling and it's all blurry. And I remember that and I was trying to open my eyes. I couldn't really see the lights and it felt like someone had hung lead weights on my eyes and I was putting all my energy into opening my eyes but I couldn't do it and I could hear people around me and every time they said something it echoed like four or five times and I heard Becky's voice and she could see me like kind of grumbling through this respirator thing and so she took it off and it took me about four or five times to say it to her and she could feel her getting closer trying to put her ear on my mouth to hear what I was saying and eventually she turned around and said, did you just ask me to marry you? And I mustered up the strength to give this little smirk and then just passed out, fell back to sleep again. So she obviously said yes. She did say yes. Yeah. Romantic. Yeah. Wow. But they have, family has been fundamental to your recovery and, and success, hasn't it? Yeah, you know, especially the little ones. You know, it's, um, I've, I've always thought I can tell them what to do and kind of try and tell them how you know how to be a good person what to do and you know how to achieve things in your life or overcome obstacles but I think it's more powerful when you show them as well so on the times when you know I do struggle and, and things are difficult that gives me that drive to be like just get on with it mate get up put your legs on get out the door and show the kids every day you're getting up you know facing your challenges going out there dominating and coming home so they're they're a, a driver a big driver and can you relate to that michael yeah i've got three kids then um, 15 13 and, and six and uh yeah they give ex, ex, extra purpose in your life you know you know they my my daughter got very upset and when she found out the story uh, but she obviously sees me as as you know dad uh, as i am but she didn't really know know my story but Hopefully, we, we inspire our children to to live a much more positive life, but also they they give me extra purpose as well in life. You know, they must be very proud of you. Yeah, pride. Yeah, I think you know. I do remind them they've only got one dad, so you know, <laughs> love or hate, I am yeah, I'm there. But no, they are proud. They're proud of what we you know we've achieved as family, what I've achieved as an individual. Um, but you know, you know, it, I've been supported you know along the way, and you know, family, friends, loved ones, and. It's been a massive part of my of my own endurance to to go on and be successful with that support, and so and the children give me a, a you know the extra energy to get up in the morning to make pancakes when I'm knackered and sure. take them out and enjoy life with them. Sounds amazing. Now, as well as your um, success that you've had um, chefing, um, you've also set up your Michael Caine's Foundation, and you support lots of charities and mm. foundations. Why is that important to you? I think giving something back is very important. Um, you know, again, it goes back to the fact that I, you know, survived a very difficult accident because other people cared. And uh, I think mentoring and inspiring people is important for the next generation, showing them, you know, uh, what's possible in the industry uh, is important. Supporting charities that are close to your heart or, or things that are cl close to the community is important. I think if you're in a public a public figure or somebody that's successful then you should look to give something back mm -hmm. I think we, we have that responsibility to nurture the next generation but also to to reach out into the community and do something for it but you know at the same time you know our stories are are, are inspirational but also it's like therapy sometimes too you know <laughs> to be able to, to have the outlet to talk about it you know it's also important and you never know what your impact's going to be either so you know anyone listening to this podcast is that you're the people that you potentially could help and I think that's what's really exciting as well and you know Mark just coming to you now you've gone on to become this an inspirational speaker and coach a successful social media influencer you've got your own business you know, you didn't just win medals at the um, Invictus Games. Mm -hmm. You sort of became the poster boy globally for them. Okay. Um, so, so you've done all right Thank as you. well. Thank you. Um, but, 
you know, Michael's spoken about the importance of giving back. I know this is really important to you as well. Tell yeah. us a bit about that. So initially, uh, years and years and years ago, when I started doing the charity work, I, I remember thinking, because within the first two weeks of being in hospital, I was visited by a military charity. And, and it sounds maybe random and a bit weird, but there was a whole... They basically came and introduced themselves to me and I didn't want to speak to them because I hadn't accepted being an amputee yet. But they were willing to take on a massive burden of paperwork and stuff that was uh, at the beginning of my recovery. And it sounds bizarre, but with like the pensions and stuff and they took that off. And then as I progressed out of my rehab, I met another one, another one. And there were, you know, adaptive adventure training expeditions and help with housing and, and all these people started helping me and I was like we need to give back back here we need to do something for these guys because you know unfortunately I was injured early on but then more and more people started coming through the system and we're like right we need to do something to help these guys and to help these guys and to help these guys and so you start doing more and more and it selfishly it feels really nice you know but you can kind of mix it up and I remember using fundraising events to challenge myself physically to see what I could do but then tie it with a fundraiser as a way of contributing and now you know 11 years down the line I look at it a little bit differently I'm still do it for that reason but then I, I I think more and more about the hundreds or maybe thousands of people that were involved in my recovery from point of explosion to now and I just kind of feel like I owe it to those people you know and that's why I live my life the way I do it's it's my way of saying thank you to them and some of them I'll never even meet but I think the worst thing I could ever do was give up on prosthetics, sit in a wheelchair, drink, get fat, you know, and just live up, just waste my life after all the effort they put into saving it. In my opinion, the the ultimate path to fulfillment is is just to give back and help other people. It, it's like I said, it's selfish, but it makes you feel great when you do it. Great, thank you. And we're just sort of getting to the end now, but I'm just going to ask you both: What does being resilient mean to you? Put you on the spot. Ooh. Um, I think that's what we've been talking about the entire time really yeah. it's, it's, it's facing you don't, you don't have to lose a limb to be resilient but it's facing um, a challenge or adversity or some difficulty you know getting knocked on your backside but then dusting yourself off and being like okay that, that's a setback you know life goes on and I'm going to live it to the fullest you know and just fighting back against the, the difficulties in your life you know and never giving up Right. Yeah, I think for me, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, I agree with all of that. And uh, would say that to never lose your spirit and who you are through life's challenges, you know. And I think Mark said it, you know, the person he was is ultimately who he is now. But it brought, circumstances brought that real inner strength out of him. Challenge, to be challenged in life is, is, is it's only then when you really, whether or not it be sport or, or work, it, until you challenge yourself or life challenges you, you don't realise how much you can give mm. or how much is within you, what capacity you have to overcome or to... So I think that's it. That spirit of human endeavour makes you resilient. And it's not always there for everybody, but we have it all within our, us. But I think that's it. Never give up that spirit of who you are. Amazing. Thank you so much. Now, my final question. Oh. Because we've now come to the end. How have you found our conversation today? I've had a great time. Yeah. I know it's been brilliant to meet you, Michael. Yeah, I've, I've been looking forward to it. And you're really good at this. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I've learned a lot. Thanks, um, I've learned a lot about both of you guys. So thank you for inviting me on. Wow, well, brilliant. Well, thank you. How about you, Michael? Yeah, it's been great. I mean, you know, um, it's actually nice to... to to listen and uh, talk with Mark in, and relate to what he went through. Some of, obviously, is very unique to his um, challenge, but also recognise that we both, you know, have ended up where we are, you know, with a similar outlook and a, a very, um, you know, very, you know, perhaps similar ethos and philosophy of life. But it's been a great experience. But more importantly, I hope that our stories can help other people mm. get through their challenges. And I think in that regard, it's been hugely rewarding for me to talk and share our stories together brilliant well thank you both so much michael keynes and mark ormrod thank you thank you